Okay, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to another Energy Savers webinar. Today, we're joined by Proven Energy Management and we'll be doing a, a short presentation on solar, batteries, automation and efficiency. Okay, the agenda today, I'll be running through a short um, summary of the energy audit program, some numbers on industry representation and figures related to all industries. We will then cross to our guests from Proven Energy Management where they will provide their presentation on some easy quick wins, solar and batteries. We're joined by Randall Martin and Nicholas Kemper today. Um, owner and manager of Proven Energy, Randall studied electronics and commenced his work life in computing and programming roles. With a deep knowledge of electrical systems and power control, he first became involved in renewables back in the early 2000s, designing and building remote off-grid power solutions for communications and mining applications. With a background in banking, Nick applies a financial analysis over all projects, utilising real client electrical data to produce realistic modelling of projects. And Nick comes from a mixed farming background and enjoys working with agriculture clients whenever the opportunities arise. We're also joined by Rebecca Tickell and Andrew Chamberlain. They'll be a little bit quiet today for this webinar, but they might um, pop a few questions in as they go. Okay. So what is the Energy Savers Project? The Queensland Farmers Federation Energy Savers Plus Extension Program is part of the Queensland Government's two billion affordable energy plan and aims to assist agricultural businesses and identify energy savings and productivity improvements. The objective of the Energy Savers Program is to assist farmers reduce energy costs by supporting the accelerated adoption of improvements in on-farm energy use. The Queensland Farmers Federation Energy Savers Team is the main delivery provider and is being assisted by industry member groups and skilled energy auditors. So why an energy audit? Basically, there are three types of energy audits um, produced on farm. We start at a type one, which is a basic energy audit. Uh, we head up to type two, where these are a more detailed energy audit. And type threes, where there's precision subsystems involved and tends to get a little bit more complex with irrigation systems, combining the energy and water nexus. Queensland Farmers Federation represents intensive, semi-intensive and irrigated agriculture in Queensland. The graph on the slide shows the spread of energy audits across these industries. To communicate these messages, we have written up case studies on different industries and technology types, and we will provide a link for these case studies at the end of the presentation. Proven energy audits have been spread across a number of, the, a number of these industries. To date, we have covered 178 farms in the program. We are near completion and the combined totals of all industries are shown in the table. There is an estimated 7,700 megawatt hours and cost savings to farmers of $2.9 million and 7,127 tonnes of CO2. As today's focus is on solar and batteries, the graph shown breaks down the number of solar systems that we have found across the audits. A total of 135 systems have been recommended with the potential to offset 2,500 megawatts and remove 2,300 tonnes of CO2. The systems range in size from five to 100 kilowatt systems, 
So the common 30 kilowatt is recommended due to network restrictions and the increased cost involved by going over that 30 kilowatts. To help maximise generation from solar on farm and to change, I guess, the end user's um, energy strategy, we have installed 50 devices, real-time energy, energy monitoring devices throughout the state. These can monitor various circuits ranging from your main load solar pumps etc and they have a, a bit of a benefit where you can monitor your main load and size a potential solar system to suit according to your to what your consumption is on on farm in the future there's also the potential to switch between circuits and i guess direct battery energy to areas on site where you need it most or um, Get, I guess load shifting at the end of the day as well. So it doesn't necessarily have to be battery stored power. It can just be a load shifting exercise. We've also identified a number of battery systems from the audit program. There's been a total of eight systems um, recommended and these have ranged from uh, full standalone systems to grid connect. We found the full grid connects, uh, sorry, the full standalone systems to be, I guess, not feasible at this point in time. They average around about 18 years, putting them out of reach for, for most individuals on farm. Where we are finding the benefits are on the systems range uh, on swirl lines, where there's restrictions to, uh, on export um, and these also provide an additional benefit where we can, you can stabilise the grid and have a more reliable source on site. There are issues around swirl lines, so there is potential for, for batteries on swirl lines at the moment to, to give a positive payback and, and provide some benefit. So that's the end of my short presentation. Um, what I might do is I might stop sharing my screen and hand over to Randall and Nick. You there, Ross? Thank you. Thanks, John. Can you hear me there? Yeah, mate, I've, I've got you. Yep. Okay, hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Nick Kemp. And uh, I'm, hi, everyone. My name's Randall Martin. Thanks for having us today. Okay. Um, okay, so with we, we do quite a lot of work in agribusiness and in commercial um, solar and energy management generally. And usually um, we always start with a, a process that works through a few steps. Firstly, looking to eliminate any waste or reduce the wasted energy that our clients um, have in their system. Um, secondly, increase, increasing efficiencies. And then after achieving these sort of quick wins, uh, looking to then create uh, savings through behind the meter generation and perhaps uh, energy storage capabilities. So we'll talk through some of those steps as we go through this, pres this short presentation, thanks. Okay, so um, I think as John was uh, speaking about there earlier with the uh, metering functionality and features that are available. Uh, the first step in any, any process of energy management is gathering data uh, as much as, it, uh, as is available. So um, for us, what that will often look like is uh, requesting uh, metering interval data from retailers and, and, and power authorities. So that in the top um, left-hand corner of your screen there, that is basically raw interval data as it comes to us in um, you know, thousands and thousands of cells, which we would um, analyze and massage into 
a load profile um, similar to what you would see on the right hand side of the screen there. Um, this sort of data is obviously useful to understand what your load looks like, how seasonal that load might be, and um, we then use that sort of information to help us design solutions going forward. In the absence of that um, data, which is not always available from the authority due to um, the types of meters that are often out there in the Ergon network, um, we are able to put in place our own metering devices and that bottom left hand corner is, is an image of, a, of, of some metering that we've recently done at a, at a, at a, at a um, large station. Um, so we, what we can see there is obviously uh, quite a substantial load from their generators that peaks in the evening. And this is the sort of data that we would need to help them create a, a hybrid um, diesel solar battery solution to, to uh, reduce their running costs. Yeah, hi guys. Look, one, one of the, you know, one of the most important things, and it, like it, it, it's always right in front of us, is to just reduce waste. Like some really simple wins, and like we can. One of the things I find is that, and like the really basic things, and you get, you've got to have a look at these, uh, like this approach first. Like you've got to look at your refrigeration, and you've got to make sure you haven't got any unnecessary refrigeration. That you've got some mass in your cool rooms. That your seals are in good working order. Lighting, we've, like, we've, we've got to make sure we aren't running lighting when it's unnecessary. We've got to make sure we've got sensors on lighting, right? And timers. Water heating is one of the really big ones because we, water is able to store a lot of energy, right? And to heat water, if we're heating it far beyond the temperature we need, we're just wasting energy. So one of the things is water heating, ensuring that our um, that ensuring that we haven't got the temperature too hot. Okay, ensuring that our you know that that we are managing the temperature of that water. Pumping, making sure our pumps are the right size, making sure they're efficient, ensuring we're not wasting water, we're not overwatering. Okay, so. Like some of these sort of reduced waste things are, you know, um, are sometimes dismissed, but I think like it costs us no, like there's no outlay for a really quick win. One, one of the things I've, I've, I've constantly see throughout the agri business is um, like you guys have a lot of motors throughout your plant running all sorts of processes. One of the things which is very, very, you know, it has a, has a very big impact on efficiency of motors and the running cost and the replacement cost is heat. Right? There, you know, it is one of the really important items is to keep them clean, right? All motors have um, cooling blades on them. We've got to keep the dust off them. It makes a massive difference. We've, We've got to ensure at the end of the at the end of the fan, or end of the motor, the fan is in good working order, helping to cool that motor. So the, I mean, this is one of the one of the um, sort of items that gets constantly missed and overlooked, right? And it, and it has a really big, significant effect, you know, through pumping, um, in air conditioning, you know, and we can deliver. Uh, it, it, it allows us to, like, we can measure the changes you know, in just cooling the motor down. It has a massive effect to reduce waste energy. And, and Randall, that could be a simple capacitor change on a single phase motor too, couldn't it? Like, yeah. like a general maintenance, yeah? Yeah, one of the, probably one of the points that we said, like we've really got to, you know, general maintenance on motors is well worth the small amount of capex. Your payback is, you know, can you know can be you know six or seven times, you know, in like in like just making sure it's operating efficiently, making sure that the capacitors are in good working order.
Okay, so, um, you know, obviously everyone's business is differently. So we all have to think about um, those opportunities for, for those quick wins and maintenance um, to, to save energy. Then um, we can look at other opportunities for increasing efficiency. So for this, it might be um, replacement of metal halide lights with LEDs is, is, a, is a common one. Uh, changing over direct drive uh, electric motors to variable speed drives. Um, inverter, refrigeration and air conditioning, uh, modern, modern equipment replacing old inefficient equipment. Um, the same goes for heat pumps. Um, in agri, we often see aeration of uh, grain silos and automating that process can save a significant amount of electricity as well. So these are examples of the, of the type of efficiencies that you uh, should be looking to, tr to, to, to find. Um, variable speed drives, I'm installing these in front of motors. Like you can get, like it allows you to get control of that motor. So straight away we're able to ensure the motor, you know, the way it starts, the way it, the way it gets to top speed and able to, you know, to manage that motor and look by managing the speed of that motor and the frequency through a variable speed drive, we're able to make that motor between 30 and 60% more efficient. Okay. And like these, like these products are available. So as you upgrade or replace motors or upgrade your plant, definitely look and ask questions about variable speed drives and installing them like in, you know, in like the new technology. I guess the secret with that sort of thing is, is, um, is where these motors are being used frequently. Uh, it's definitely worth the investment. Okay, um, moving on from that, we, we, the next slide is sort of moving into the renewable space and what we can see there is, is some charts from our monitoring software of different sites. And we're just making the point here that not all electrons are created equal. So when we create an electron or some electricity from the process of solar voltaic um, generation, um, depending on how we're using that is um, going to, to depend or determine the value of that to us. So we really have to think about uh, this when we're, when we're designing systems or um, how we use them. So on the left, obviously, what we've got there is um, the red being power that's being imported from the grid, uh, the, the green being um, solar generation that is being exported back into the grid, and then blue being the solar that is being self-consumed by this household. Um, so it's, it's, it's obvious there that um, only the blue is being self-consumed. That is the highest value there uh, in terms of their solar generation the export. In this case, they're able to export and that has a lower value. And then they're importing the higher value uh, electricity from the grid when they're using most of it at night. So whilst that system stacks up and pays for itself, thanks to the export uh, feed-in tariff um, presently available, that is um, not the most efficient way of using solar. The middle system, you can see there is only a very small amount of export early in the morning before that load is being switched on. And that load is basically um, almost met uh, by the peak of that solar curve. So that is a very efficient um, use of that energy that's being generated. And over on the right, we have another system that's quite efficient. However, um, that is on the Ergon network and it's an over 30 kilowatt system and the Ergon network uh, will not allow that to be exported. So you can see that system is being uh, clipped and, and clamped by the inverters during the day to maintain the output of power at the same level as the load. Um, and where the load is less than what the solar can create, it, the inverters have to um, basically limit the amount of power being created. So again, that's not the most efficient um, application. So in that case, we really want to see 
more load applied so that system can be um, producing at its capacity. Um, this chart is more in terms of the financial side of it. Um, what we see there is the, the um, demand and cost of electricity currently in the Queensland market. And you can see during the middle of the day, demand and prices go down. And then in the evening, uh, demand and prices go up. Now, price is certainly not following um, demand in the, in, in directly, but you can see that line just edging up during the evening there. Um, as the peak demand hits the peak. Um, so in the same way, you, you can imagine if we were generating a lot of electricity during the middle of the day, its commercial value is less. And, and that's just simply following this um, relationship of supply and demand. Okay, so, um, so following from that, when we think about adding uh, behind the meter generation, we are really concerned with getting a good correlation between the time of producing energy and the time of using that energy with our electrical loads. Um, the, the, the efficiency or the financial re rewards are going to be uh, improved by a higher relationship between um, using the energy. So if you're using 365 days a year, that's going to be better than five days a week or, or, or you know, um, 60 days a year or, or, or whatever lower um, consumption that you might have. So we really have to think about that in terms of sizing our, our generation to meet what our regular loads look like. Um, obviously the cost of electricity has a big bearing on the paybacks and the returns. So the more you're paying, the higher that return is going to be, or the more viable your system is going to be. And um, you also have to be thinking about whether you're a, a small customer with a flat rate tariff or a large energy user with a peak demand charge and um, lower volume charges built into it. So uh, these are all the factors that we need to consider when determining what uh, size systems are, are suitable and financially um, make sense. Yeah, look, um, I'll just run you through a few, like a real, some, like how we go about making sure we get the best return of investment for a solar system. This example here is a farmer and it's pretty much just a, a um, 25 kilowatt pump. Before, so before we build anything, we speak to the farmer about his time of use, how much water he wants to use and get an understanding of the pump. Secondly, we have to work out the electrical, the electrical characteristics of that pump, okay? And once we understand those two, two bits of data, we're able to go away and design a system, okay? And we, and, and we speak with the farmer and we try and understand about, you know, what else can we value add? Um, how does he control this pump? In this particular case, this farmer had to drive down to the holding dam, which was a fair way from, the, from his homestead, turn the pump on and then return that evening and turn the pump off. Now, in this case, we were able to design a system that, that he was able to control remotely from his phone and we were we were also able to set that pump up so it starts and stops itself in sun hours okay so in this particular application we we ended up building a 27 kilowatts worth of solar 25 kilowatt inverter we set up with the with the app, the same app that the same application on his phone that he's able to monitor the solar to be able to control this pump. So I mean, he can now control this pump remotely, and we've pretty much eradicated right his pumping bill, as you can see there. Like nearly probably about ninety five percent of the energy used from his solar we use to move the water for him now. 
and he can control this pump remotely. Okay, so there's some of our common sort of practices, you know, to try, you know, to try and ensure we get the best return. You make a good point, Randall. There that um, it's not just an energy efficient um, practice; it's it's a time saving measure as well. So you know, you, you try and capture things outside of the energy bubble and try and provide the best outcome you can. So and that could that could lead to a production increase and you know in, in other areas on the farm. So mate, it, it's a really good point. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it also gives him flexibility to be able to turn that pump on at any time of the day. If he has to pump at night or turn it off at night or, you know, it doesn't have to be on the property to manage that pump anymore. So, you know, so that, so that saves time. One, one, one of the real important things like in developing my, my business is data and being able to identify technologies that are reliable, efficient, right, and that are able to give us numbers so remotely we can monitor the systems and we monitor people's power use back here in Brisbane so we can monitor all over the state. So on, on this journey, look, look, we have become able to use microwave links, um, Wi-Fi links, RS-485 links, and using um, industrial gear to be able to, you know, transfer this data kilometres and kilometres over properties to be able to get it back here to my office. So when we have a fault finding, I have a, have a fault finding problem, I'm able, to I'm, I'm able to assess it from my desktop rather than having to deal with the expense of going to site. It also allows me to communicate with the farmer in their office at their desktop and for us to work out what's going on. If there is a problem, or we'll work out why his load's increased. I'll run you through an example. Can you go to the next slide? The next slide, is that the next one? Well, yeah, well, I'm, I, I have an example in, in a couple of slides where this was a real live, a real live case recently where we were able to, where we needed to get the data going before we were able to fault find. The other, the other thing is that things like operating those pumps remotely from anywhere in the world relies upon this uh, smart connectedness between the monitoring platform and the devices out there in the field. So, you know, without these, um, these, these communications devices, you, you simply can't do that sort of thing. And with that, guys, um, I guess there is some connection issues in regional areas. So you could go to, I guess, a, a low, um, a low uh, area signal, isn't it? Like say Lorawan or something like that to try and cut down on the, the cellular network. So you, you're pushing Telstra and that aside and putting in something a little bit separate that you can run on, on site. Would that be the case? Yeah, like um, say for instance, if I'm trying to control a pump or a, or a motor or or manage the data from a solar system, I can I can get off that network and 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 set up a very simple serial serial network, data link, okay, and bring that back to an area where there is a good connection, like maybe back to the homestead's um, inter, internet connection, okay, and you know that's what we've definitely found in those places is we can't really rely on the uh, mobile network to constantly be able to um, get our data back to us. By putting in our own networks, we're, you know, we're able to have a, a much more reliable network. So um, moving on from that, um, as well as load shifting and using, um, using um, things like the um, control of pumps and so on to, to try and bring our load into the middle of the day where we're, we're generating. Um, you know, we, there's always other opportunities in a, in a, a rural environment or um, agri-business environment to, um, to use energy and, 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 and these are quasi energy storage uh, solutions. So, um, Obviously, we spoke earlier about heating water. So you can, um, in a domestic or commercial application, you can set up relays or timers 
that make sure that the water is being heated when there is surplus solar available. Um, you can set up relays or timers to make sure that your pumps are pumping to high tanks or turkey nests if that is, you know, if moving water is a part of what you need to do. Um, we've already spoken a little about cool rooms and air conditioning, but there are things we can do to um, make sure that we're using more of the energy that's available to us during the middle of the day and relying less on buying energy or, um, or, or running generators um, when the sun isn't shining when it comes to solar. So this is an area where everyone can be an innovator in their own environment, looking for processes or uh, energy consumption that you can time shift. The next slide is a great example of, of this happening on, you know, on, a, on a large scale at the University of the Sunshine Coast. What we've got here is a, a, a very large storage tank. It's actually 4.5 megalitres of water there. And they have got a 2.1 megawatt solar farm that they use to refrigerate that water in the tank. And they create a very large water battery that effectively um, allows them to take that cool water and um, use that to reduce the amount of refrigeration, traditional air conditioning refrigeration required to cool the university. And this is saving them about 36% of their electricity expense, which will amount to about $100 million over 25 years. So, um, you know, that's, that's a piece of innovation, but Perhaps in our own environments, we, we will find, you know, opportunities that are not too dissimilar to that. I could think of an opportunity possibly um, next to a dam or something like that, mate, where you could use those solar panels to capture additional runoff when it's raining. Because so sometimes the water, I guess, just it gets absorbed by, by the uh, soil, you know, instantly. So... You know, places out, out west where you could use solar panels like that, funnel the water in, and with a, an additional tank, you could store even more water on site. So it could definitely be beneficial for a farm. Okay, um, now just talking about batteries themselves. So as John mentioned earlier, batteries are often economically marginal unless you're in an off-grid situation or we can um, create a value stack of more than one of, of these sort of benefits. So there's obviously the traditional time shifting of generation from the middle of the day um, to the battery and then reusing it later on. So that is, is clearly uh, going to save the purchase of electricity later on, but that in itself is usually not enough. So um, other opportunities exist, which include changing to a time of use tariff, which is um, usually uh, more expensive at the peak times, which, which is, you know, depends on the tariff. But for example, between four and eight o'clock at night, um, the tariff will usually be quite expensive. If you have a battery that will um, potentially eliminate you buying at those more expensive times and then being able to use energy at the cheaper times um, can be an additional value add. Uh, peak demand management for large uh, consumers of energy, if they have large but um, short duration peaks, batteries can be very useful for reducing those demand charges. So that can be enough to uh, make batteries commercially viable. And in an off-grid hybrid situation, such as running a diesel generator and then, and then trying to reduce the runtime of that with solar, you would need a battery in there to uh, smooth and stabilize that system. Um, Non-financial benefits is, of batteries that need to be considered and, and are certainly worthwhile is uh, in many places they can addition assist in strengthening and um, making the system more robust so that um, by having your own generation of solar and batteries behind the meter, you're, um, when you, at times of peak use, you're pulling 
um, less power through the grid and therefore placing less strain on the grid, which can often mean um, that the, the system will stay up rather than browning out or um, tripping a breaker. Um, and obviously, if you have the right type of battery solar system, uh, they can offer a, a backup when the grid does fail. Okay, this, um, this um, graph on the left-hand side is a grid-connected battery system. And the green is the energy that the solar system produced, charged the battery with, and exported, okay? The blue on the right-hand side of the, of the um, solar bell curve is the battery discharging in the evening. So the sun goes down, that battery, that battery starts to discharge and runs, runs all evening through to next morning to 4, to 4 a.m. We can see there's a couple of really big peaks in the load there in the evening. That, that may be them a pump running or um, an element turning on or an air conditioning turning on. But in this case here, that battery was pretty much able to, um, was charged during the day and discharged all night until 4 a.m. Then the red is what we had to purchase from the grid, right? before the sun would come up the next morning and start to recharge the battery and supply that load. That is a, a, a general description of a grid connect battery system. So that's a sort of a, 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 standard, a standard household, five kilowatt, six kilowatt solar system with a 10 kilowatt battery. The one on the, the, one on the right hand side is a remote, no, so there's no network, not, it's not grid connected system, okay? And the red in this graph would, would indicate, um, on the, the top chart, yeah. the, the red is the consumption. Yeah. On, on, on the top chart, the red is the consumption, okay? And the orange is the solar curve and under there is the load, okay? And we, and we can see, uh, like dragging that down to the bottom chart where the where our, where we where we're using energy during the day on the left as a, as the, as the sun comes up right the blue is the battery discharging after the sun hours and the red on the bottom chart is the generator having to run in the you know through the middle of the night and then the solar would start again okay and and then the battery discharged the next day. So in, in that case there, you know, like we've built a system that has reduced the generator runtime, okay, and, and, and the expense on diesel fuel. Just quickly, Randall, just yep. to get to that stage, mate, uh, with the design, yep. like you really have to go through those first steps that were discussed uh, at the start of the presentation there in terms of you really have to reduce your consumption first, otherwise you could be potentially oversizing your system. Is yes. that the case? Yeah. Yeah, look, um, um, it, it, it really is very, very important that we spend a lot of time looking at the numbers, okay? And in that scenario there, the battery is, is if not the most expensive item on that checklist, on, on that, you know, like when we install that. And we're a big believer of, like, you don't want to oversize that, okay? Because we're over in, we're over, we really end up over investing in that system where we still have an already pre existing diesel generator system that's been, that, that is um, already working, um, it's reliable. But, we, but the main aim for our customer is wanting to reduce the spend on diesel fuel, okay? And we've got to run through all those numbers. We've got to do our homework. We've got to ask a lot of questions. We've got to put monitoring equipment on that system because we can't get any information from the network. And we've got to spend our time understanding what they're using now, where their headspace is in the future, right? And just making sure we don't over-invest, right? in that system is one of the most important things, you know, 
to, you know, because, you know, the, the brief was to reduce the spend on diesel. They, the, the, the brief was not to get rid of my diesel cost to reduce it. So we're able to find the right balance between investing in that system and, and still spending a bit on diesel. I guess, you know, what we're seeing is that for um, removing the first 60 to 70% of the, of the diesel expense in, in these systems is, 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 is very achievable and financially stacks up very well. And then uh, to remove that last 20, 30, 40% of, of that diesel expense in, in one of those off-grid systems is exponentially more expensive. To get to those last um, kilowatts is, is, requires upsizing of everything to a degree that you, to cater for um, you know, real outlier events. So it's not worth it. Yeah, and the, I mean, and the technologies, the, the technology is here now, and it's fantastic, and it's all automated. Um, we are able to get live streaming data, minute by minute, to be able to manage it. So, you know, you know that's that's how we, you know, able to design these systems. Well, um, okay. So, just just touching back on how important the um the data is and we you know we keep talking about data but this is a great example where we were asked to assess a system okay this is a solar edge lg battery system and when we first assessed this system the thing we found out with the thing we noticed straight away the data was not working properly and was incorrect so the first thing we had to do was actually get the data working um, set it up correctly get the metering you know, get the metering, giving us information back here in our office that we could actually make sensible decisions. The, um, even being on site, working with that gear, we were not able to ascertain whether it worked because we didn't, we didn't have the data. So we're able to, so it just shows you how important that, how important to get that data is to be able to make um, assessments on this big investment that you know so so once again you know we're talking about making sure we set up the data from the beginning you know we monitor the data of the systems just to ensure we're getting return on investment we're not asking the customers to do that you know they have access to it but it just like here back in our office it, like it's a big part of our day to day making sure our systems are operating we get alarms if there's issues and then we're able to contact you and work out what's going on um, so in this case here once we were able to get the data we were able to help this customer start to fault find and, and get this system back on track um, so just in that chart, I guess the, the, what we can identify pretty easily straight away on the left-hand side is that there's not very much green there and um, the loads are quite high during the day. So they're absorbing all of that solar generation and that's leaving very little for, um, for um, charging the battery. So in this case, it's got two 10 kilowatt hour batteries, 20 kilowatt hours of battery that, that, that should be getting charged. And, um, the, the, the chart on the right down on, at the bottom on the right showing that one of those batteries is getting a charge, the other one is, is well, it's getting part charge and the other one is getting very little charge. And this is just simply a design problem with the system and probably a lack of data up front. Um, we won't spend too much time on this, but obviously these systems, these hybrid diesel solar battery systems range in size from, you know, large industrial size on the left where you might have megawatts of solar and large, you know, hundreds and uh, potentially megawatts of, of battery to support that um, along with your diesel gen sets um, to what you might see in a, in a, in a, in a farmhouse or um, domestic situation on the right, where um, that system there is a uh, 14 kilowatt hour battery with six kilowatts of inverters, and that will operate a um, 
staff and stock the gen set as well to maintain continuity of supply. So it's a, you know, there's, there's no limit, large or small. Yeah, so um, this is a, another example of a, that is a pump, um, a, a, a ball. And this is a really good example. And it, um, it's just a DC solar array of up to 100 kilowatts. And it feeds a variable speed, a variable speed drive. And that variable speed drive is quite special because it's able to be fed the DC directly from the panels or the AC from the generator. And in these, in these situations, it's, a, it's quite like, in this particular environment, there's no network available, right? And we're able to um, couple, use the solar energy when it's available and reduce our spend on diesel, or during, uh, during when there's a lot of solar available, actually shut down the diesel that's running that pump, right? And just run solely on the, solely on the um, solar. And in the afternoon, as the sun starts going down, start the diesel generator back up, right? And it, it and, the, and they, um, and gradually as the sun drops down, the diesel generator takes over the full pumping load. So this is a quite an efficient way of actually um, using the, the DC input and an existing diesel generator. Okay, and it's with a, it's with a special variable speed drive. And there's no network connection there. So if we go to the next, in, in, in this slide, in this slide, it's the same technology. It has two variable speed drives, which can take a straight DC input from the solar, right? In this particular case, it's running off the network. Okay, so once again, we're able to run directly from the solar panels or the network to run your pumps. Okay, this, this application, this technology is, is really designed for pumps. Okay, and it's really efficient and very cost effective. And, you know, and, that's, and that look there is sort of all the information we can get from that monitoring of that. Like it's telling us how much, you know, uh, the pumps that are running, we can get down to the liters per minute. We can put all sorts of metering and equipment for the farmer to, to, to manage the two pumps. You can turn them on and off, on and off remotely. And um, obviously, um, de depending on what time of the day it is or how, how clear a day you've got, you'll have a different level of irradiance and different power being supplied directly from those solar panels. But this system will automatically blend that with the other power source that's available, whether that be the grid or a, a, a generator, to make sure that these pumps remain at the right speeds and pressures to continue to do what they need to do um, in, in that system. So, you know, obviously that reduces the spend from the grid or in, in diesel runtime. Um, this is another one. This is a much simpler version. It's a straight DC, um, a, a DC input solar pump, and it's and the and it's actually a DC pump that would be in that that would be down the bore or on the on or on the damn wall. Um, so this is a, a very common approach. It's very efficient. Um, disadvantages about this system are that we can only run it in during sun hours. The pumps. Uh, are able to really change their frequency, to change their pumping pressures. So if you have applications where you need to pump water in just sun hours, these are very, very economical, economically viable. Um, this slide is, um, is, is just basically, um, once, once things are set in place, once we've gone through that process of of gathering data, um, finding efficiencies, and um, reducing waste, designing a system, that's not where it ends because um, the systems on, on, on our uh, clients' properties are constantly changing. So this chart on the left from the 22nd of June, 2019, um, you might notice the scales are a little bit different here. That's a, a solar, 
solar um, PV system that we installed. And the, at that point in time, the clients were uh, using about 50 kilowatt load during the day and our system was generating just under 80 kilowatts. So there was export going back into the grid. Now, move forward 12 months, this business has grown significantly and we can see now clearly in the monitoring on a day by day basis that there is a demand for more generation during the middle of the day. And this will only increase um, over the next few months as they finish their expansion plan. So this client's now increasing their um, solar with us by 150%. So it's just a matter of the better our data, um, the, the easier it is to understand what's going on from an energy point of view in the business and the easier it is to make decisions moving forward. So you'd be far better off designing a system to match your load and then add to your system later on. Otherwise, you're going to be over-investing in that system. Usually, that would be correct. I mean, it depends on what, what, what is foreseeable in, in, in the business because there are certain things that we do want to avoid. For example, you mentioned earlier with systems over 30 kilowatts, um, there is some more expense and that, that comes in the form of of um, application fees to the network. And that can be five to $10,000 of basically, you know, dead money that's not buying plant and equipment each time we go back to the network to do an expansion. So where we can, we want to size for the foreseeable future. But when we're talking about large systems like this one, which will be 250 kilowatts, uh, when we're done, um, I guess that's you know, that, that expense is amortised over the whole size of the project anyway. Sure. Um, so I guess that with anything, um, usually if you, you'll find that there are, most of your uh, benefits are going to come from a small number of key, key um, actions. So once we've gone through the process of identifying the um, opportunities in your business, we usually be able to tell very quickly um, where the most bang for the buck is going to be achieved. So, um, you know, it's, n it's not necessarily something you have to look at every far reaching corner of your business. Usually uh, a few key actions is going to get most of the results that you're looking for. That brings to conclusion uh, our part of the presentation. Thank you, John and, and QFF. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. That was that was really good. Um, you raised some good points there. Um, we don't we haven't had any questions pop up for you guys, so I might get you to stop sharing your screen there, and I'll finish off. coming up just yet. Can you guys see that okay? But... Randall, you see that uh, wrapping up slide, mate? I'm just, no, I can't see the wrapping up slide. No, we can see all of your you slides. You can see all the slides. Okay. Sorry guys, it's not playing the game. Okay, I'll just run with this quickly. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us today. Um, Randall and Nick, that was, that was a great um, presentation. We will have some great take home messages there, mate. Um, just to follow up um, on their work, uh, we've got a battery case study from one of their audits um, on our website. So feel free to jot that down and, and check out others that we've, we've written um, from the program. Um, further, if, if you want to subscribe to our um, newsroom, we will have um, stories coming out on various aspects of energy efficiency as they come to light. 
and, and other important matters related to energy. Um, if, if you have any questions from today or anything that pops to mind on technology, um, let us know uh, at the email address listed there and we'll, we'll get in touch with you guys. So um, thanks, Seth, everybody. So thanks for that. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next one. We'll get some news out to you and uh, get you on board. Cheers. Thank you.